Process resonates with us. So, for example, a mom voice or a parental voice oh, might okay. come come into play, you know, on an automatic basis. So it, it hits a trigger of of our own. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And um, if, if we're not listening carefully, we can miss details and jump to conclusions. Um, so our way to deal with that was to um, work on being self-aware. Oh, yeah, and um, especially. <laughs> We're going to come back to how you do that. <laughs> 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 There's a lot of humility here amongst my group here. Nobody wants to make a decision. But we, we, we were born with uh, being confronted to be, make decisions. Uh, your mother asks you to make a decision, and you make decisions from the very beginning. And, and oftentimes, uh, the temptation is to prejudge uh, a situation, unfortunately, just based upon the uh, claims that's being made. I mean, you go into mediation, having read about the claim, and the temptation, it's almost impossible to ignore some decision or judgment being made based upon the initial claim before you get all the facts. Mm -hmm. So just from the beginning, you're thinking about what would you do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We thought that mediator frustration is often oh, interesting. progress mm -hmm. or conflict among the parties. So if I just tell them what to do, yeah, that'll exactly. resolve the problem. Exactly. <laughs> Boy, I wish. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we said two things. One um, was internal bias that maybe you don't recognize, but you're favoring a party and sort of leading something in one direction. What was the other thing that we initially said? Oh, that we need to come to an agreement. So kind of like what they were saying. So pushing an agreement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, and I, I appreciate that because I think that, that that is one of the things towards the end that, that pushes us to do that is, is that we're supposed to get an agreement. But we'll talk about that. <laughs> well, we kind of we, we went, went around in circles a little bit because I don't think either of us have that judge mentality when we go in, into the room. We know our role is neutral and try to just emphasize that all the way through. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a problem? <laughs> Not in that regard. So, <laughs> um, you spoke of ego and I had spoken of 
sometimes something can trigger <laughs> to my neutrality. Like I'm usually, I usually feel pretty centered, but there's something, and often for me, it's power. It's a sensing of power and balance. That power and balance, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was this group's um, issue as well. In back, the group in back. So I think a combination of what was already said about wanting to move things forward and get resolution, and and also the fact that well, obviously we have more experience, we have we're neutral, we see the bigger picture, so we're obviously the ones to help move things forward. And oh, I love that. We know better. Yeah, <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> That's very cool. So um, <clears throat> I think the parties. I have a, a frog in my throat. This is not good. <coughs> okay, the parties also, I brought some stuff. <laughs> um, man one, I have everything here, nothing's working. <coughs> well, okay, you have to keep talking because I can't. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> All right, there it goes. Um, the parties also play into it. That is, they look at us, and s do they ever actually ask for your opinion? Oh, yeah. Sure. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> so that makes it worse, doesn't it, when they ask for our opinion, because we have one. I think nobody said that, but I think that that's really the basis of our problem is have any of you ever not had an opinion? No. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's the difficult. That's the basis of the difficulties. We've got that opinion, and then what do we do with it? But sometimes our opinion is different from that of our co-mediate. Mm -hmm. That's true, which is helpful if that's true, right? Well, it may be helpful because oh, you yeah. could get into an argument. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't even thought about that one. Okay, good. Um, so, given all of those situations, the parties may actually ask for our opinion. Uh, we're frustrated because they're not reaching an agreement. We know what they should do anyway. Right? <laughs> um, so how do we not give an opinion? How do we avoid, and how do we even avoid their asking us for an opinion? Because wouldn't that be nice if we could find a way that they didn't even ask us? Should you go back into your groups? Talk about that. Two minutes. Go back into your groups talk about that. How can we avoid it? How can we even avoid their asking us for So okay, let me let me go back to some answers that you got. And this time I'd like to start with the last group. So what what did the groups in back have to say? Um, we thought about like saying it out at the beginning so it won't come like in the middle of a conversation. So what would you, for example, say what? Oh, as part of the preamble, we usually say, you know, we're not lawyers, we can't give you advice. So just letting you know that we can't do that. Right, but also maybe at different points, if they appear to be deferring to you, just to say, remember, it may be, you know, my room, but it's your conversation. So saying early and often yeah. that you know, can give advice. Cool. Um, other group in back, any anything to add? Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> so we, we're talking about two. We may need to, um, especially if they are getting this urgency to get on with it, um, and and want you to. Thanks for coming. Tell them what Bye. to do. Mm -hmm. um, just a reminder. That just a reminder. Yeah. That they don't have to settle, but if they want, let's continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other groups? Did you come up with other any other things? Or was that it? Just tell them early and often? So why don't we? If it's that simple, and that's all we have to do, why don't we? Well, we do. We say it right in the contract. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean they hear it or they understand Good. it. Good. That's right. Good. So one of the things that we need to know is that at the beginning of a mediation, you know, we do we make up these wonderful opening statements. <coughs> we in our trainings we learn them and we practice them and we perfect them. And the parties are doing what 
at the worrying beginning about of the that mediation. Talking meter. <laughs> <laughs> We're worrying about what is this animal that's mediation, and what am I going to say? So, in some ways, <clears throat> that opening statement, uh, the words that we say don't penetrate at all into the parties. What does penetrate is tone and pacing and calming, and I definitely think the opening statement is worth doing because it does set the tone and it allows us to slow people down and to pace them. But do they hear our words? Not even a chance. So our expectation that they know what it is that we've said um, from that opening statement, I think we just need to understand that that's not the case. So what do we do about that? Do we know what they think? If they're not listening to us and not understanding what we're saying, what, what are they thinking? Well, what should we do? What, what should we do about the fact that they do, they haven't heard our admonition that we're not a judge <laughs> and that we're not going to give advice? What should we do about that? Yeah. Yeah, say it again. Say it again. Good. There's one thing I do at the beginning, and I don't know if it's really kosher or not, but in that introductory statement, I ask them questions sometimes when I say, you know, uh, mediation's the in thing these days, you know, it's really cool. Notice when they build these new courthouses, they give us rooms for mediation. <laughs> um, why do you think that is? Why is it, you turn on the radio and you hear about mediation in the Middle East, why do you think it's doing so what, and they so, answer my so question. So instead of just talking, have them Yeah, and, and I think that yep. when you're saying they don't hear that initial statement, I think they hear it more when you're forcing them to answer yeah. a question. If, there, if there's going to be a quiz, I better listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. Good. And then repeating it, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking that there are different ways that we could check for their understanding of that. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. was saying. Yeah, you could certainly make a statement and then say, do you have any questions about it? So right. another way to do it. What does that mean to you? Yep. One of the ways that I do it is by meeting with people separately first. Mm -hmm. And they're much more likely to hear it in, in that separate meeting, but even then. But then repeating it in the joint meeting, <laughs> there's more of a chance that they're going to hear it. Um, but then repeating it as well when, when they ask for advice is the time that they'll hear it. That's when they really will hear it, is when they're asking. Um, so, yeah. When you run into a situation where the mediation is virtually finished, say people are fighting over, you know, the new driveway that's coming in and there's an argument about where it's going to be, and you saw that argument, but what, you, what you're thinking to yourself is if they were putting in a new dark, um, driveway and they've solved the construction problem with that, what time of day is it going to be? <laughs> and, you know, because you're thinking, you know, well, this is an at-home mom with three little kids. Mm -hmm. Does she want the kids running out of the pavement while it's being put in? <laughs> And nobody's bringing that up. Mm -hmm. What do you do? So I don't have a problem with raising concerns. It's, it's only when you say, but don't forget that, that you shouldn't do it at this time. In other words, you don't want to tell them. But to ask them, would you like to talk about the question of timing? Yeah. Is that an issue? No problem with doing that. Yeah. You know, if, if the parties uh, come to mediation <coughs> assuming that they're going to get a resolution or a decision, because that's they, they think the mediator's responsibility, uh, it may be helpful to point out to them that mediation does not even have to be successful to be of value. Uh, Pointing out that this is an opportunity for you to know so much more right. about the issues, unlike a, a, a general civil where you may have a discovery. This is going to be your discovery period. But but let's talk about that that one that that ever that several of you mentioned the frustration at the end when they haven't come to an agreement, mm -hmm. and that and our uh, thought is to really push them. Let's talk about other options of things to do instead of that. What do you think? What, what, what other things are there to do rather than giving suggestions? Yeah? Is it possible that the mediator just needs to take a break and say, I, have to go? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> just because maybe you're building 
putting all this tension in yourself, and it's your or, or give them a break, too. Yeah. And it does turn out that when people move, they are much more creative mm -hmm. than when they sit. Mm -hmm. So actually, giving a break is an excellent thing to do for people to move around and, to, and they may come back with ideas that they didn't have before. So it's actually a fabulous idea on about 12 different levels. What else could we do at the end when we're really frustrated and they're not reaching an agreement? Assuming you haven't yet, you could caucus. Caucus if you haven't done that, sure. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really like to do is <clears throat> to ask them, what would, what should your next steps be to try to resolve this? What else could you do to try to resolve this? What else is out there to help you with it? And I'm one of these people that loves putting options up on the flip chart. <laughs> so I go off and I write options. <laughs> and then <clears throat> they have them list. These are process options rather than outcome options. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, could you made me go back to the first question with that question when you were saying, um, you were talking about why do we judge? And I had to re ask Sally because we're taught not to, but the human thing is to do it even just because the we way don't we're, lose our humanity no, just because we took just that because we're, training. Yeah, because it's <laughs> just the way we're raised. You yeah. do it. But um, I don't know. Can we as mediators, because I don't remember that part because I, I don't come a lot sometimes. But are we supposed to, or can we give them resources outside of mediation? Can we do that? Because I don't remember if that's in the training, that if we can do that or not. So, Belinda, is that allowed? You know what I mean? Like, sometimes they don't know about things, or um, like they say, when they go calm down, a lot of times you can come back together, even mm -hmm. couples, sometimes you need to go calm down. So there, there, it may not play out oh. this way in small claims just because okay. it's a different animal in and of itself. But okay. in some other mediations, there are times where the procedural process approach might be to check into other resources. So the mediator may ask, well, do you have enough information to move forward? Um, do you think where could you, have, you go to get that where information? Where would you like to go? Uh, would you like to explore other resources out there? And if they are agreeable to that, um, you know, because of the Google, it's easy to do, you know, easier to do, so they're yeah. able to do that if that's what they want to do. And, and that's a good point because most uh, people bring a phone or something where they yeah. can actually do it at the yeah, table so yeah, so to look up resources. So the answer is yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And in, in oh, private mediation, for sure, but I wanted yeah, to check what I was with the, the okay. center as well. Okay. Well, yeah. We often will have people who <clears throat> want to talk to an insurance company mm -hmm. in the middle of a mediation, so that's kind of that idea. Yeah, that okay. Is okay. Some and they aren't allowed to bring their phones in in most courts, so then we have to hand them our phone. And say, oh, oh, right. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's why I was yeah. taking papers. Okay. So when I talk about process oh. options, is everybody clear what that is, or should we talk about what I'm, mean, what I'm meaning by that? Let's talk about it. So <clears throat> an outcome might be um, fix the driveway at 6 p.m. instead of noon. Uh, a process option is um, how can we find out when these people work? <coughs> I didn't hear you. When this, when what? I just didn't hear you. How can we find out when the people work, what times of day they work? Um, or another process option might be <clears throat> uh, can we uh, can we go to court to get an advisory opinion? Or could we go to an arbitrator instead of a mediator? So those are all processes, but they're not the actual outcome. And what I find is that helping people get process suggestions is a way of moving them towards an agreement. And the, the amazing thing to, so if I ask people, so what could you do, given, given that you haven't reached an agreement today, what next steps might there be? What could you do to move towards a resolution of this? Well, what comes out of people's mouths first is court, court right? Mm -hmm. We could go to court. So you write it down and then say, what other options? <clears throat> because <clears throat> just because that came out first doesn't mean they should talk about it. You want to get as many options as you can. And eventually, they'll, they'll go to arbitration. They may go to. Um, in family stuff, friend of the court, they may um, talk about 
going to their neighbor or going to an expert or looking it up on YouTube or whatever it is that they, that they want to do. Eventually, if they don't mention it, I will write down um, continue mediation. <laughs> and the amazing thing to me is a lot of times people looking at that list of other options, they'll think, maybe we should just sit here a little longer <laughs> and actually try to work it out. So um, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they'll go to the other options as well. But, <clears throat> but I do find that that is a help in getting them to think about, ooh, we're here. Maybe we should just take advantage of the fact that we're here. And so a lot of people will do that given uh, that process option. And that's a way of getting around telling people what to do, but getting them to, to sort of recommit to trying to work it out themselves. Sometimes uh, if they don't know how the process works, if they assume that with the mediation isn't successful, they're going on to see the magistrate or the judge that same day, try to make it clear that, that if we're not successful here in mediation, this will be scheduled for they understand two, three weeks in the future, that may cause them to pause a minute and say, well, what do I want to try to resolve today as opposed mm -hmm. to having to come back three weeks from mm -hmm. now? Mm -hmm. And again, it's talking about process, not talking about outcome. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that from my point of view, it's okay for us to make decisions about process. <coughs> what we can't make decisions about is outcomes. So, for example, one process decision we may make is we're going to have a caucus now. <laughs> or the process decision that I make is I'm going to talk to people before they separately before they come in together. Um, that's fair game for us. Process is fair game for us. What's not fair game is to tell them the outcome that they should come to. So, um, we t the second item that I was supposed to talk about was the need to play dumb, and that fits in with this very nicely. Because <clears throat> if all else fails, and they're demanding that we tell them what to do, I find it very helpful to just say, well, I actually don't know. Or my favorite, I was in a mediation yesterday <clears throat> where the, the, um, the parties were each making a proposal on, can I even remember what the topic was? See, I don't even remember topics. It's just like I'm noticing what, what they're doing. Um, boy, that's so interesting. I, have no, I cannot remember what the topic was. So <clears throat> one of them, um, I was in, they were in caucus. So I was talking with one <laughs> side. And the attorney was by this time pacing. And that goes into my next topic. Um, <laughs> and saying, we've made a fair proposal. I have no idea why they're saying no. What we're proposing is fair. And so my response to that was, boy, they both sound fair to me. Um, I don't think fair is the issue. I think the issue is, do you want to come out of here reaching an agreement or not? If you do, I think you both have to move. Do you want to do it? So just not even having any idea of what the right answer is, <laughs> is, I think, a very helpful thing to do. Are any of you old enough to have watched Columbo? Mm -hmm. yes. 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 I, I think of Columbo often when I'm doing mediation. Because <laughs> it's sort of that attitude of... He's always coming back. Yeah, um, you know, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> and, the, and since I have the rumpled raincoat, it all fits in. Um, and then you come back with the right question, right? Yeah. Because Columbo always came back with the right question. Um, but I think that sort of that attitude of, oh, gee, I don't know. <laughs> do you know? Is very, very helpful. Um, now, can you do that when you do know? That's the question. And so I think it takes, this is going to really sound stupid, it really takes practice to convince and convincingly sound dumb. <laughs> and there are people who look at me and they'll say, I thought you were a lawyer. <laughs> oh, yeah, but lawyers don't know everything. <laughs> there are things I know. It's just not that one. <laughs> yeah. You don't really know what's best in the situation. Oh, I have no idea what's best. Yeah. No. So no. You can, can you I can be clear on that. Yeah. yeah. I don't really know. Yeah. yeah. Yes. See, that's great. And you, you look really convincing. I have no idea what you should do. <laughs> so let's talk about it. Why would you? And, and I think 
One of the other questions is, are we allowed to give options? Can we talk about different options for them? And I find if I can find three options for them to talk about, I'm not so likely to tell them what to, what to do. And the way I usually phrase it is, would it be helpful for me to talk about what other people have done in similar situations? And then I'll give them two or three different ideas that I won't even take credit for. So other people have done those things. Because if I take credit for it, I'm more attached to it. <laughs> so I just want to push it off on those other people who have done it. And then they are willing to pick it up and, and kind of think about it more if I've done that, if I've said These are, this is what other people have done. Sounds like all solutions in disguise. Well, but it's uh, options. Yeah. I'm, not tell, I'm not giving them, this is the thing that other people have done. It's these three things that well, you but, can think about. But there's still solutions. Cause they, they well, options are, yeah. yeah. options are always solutions. Yeah. Options are always solutions. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Is it acceptable to give multiple, like, financial options like you could split it 75 20 yeah. or 75 yeah, absolutely 50 50. i think that's the kind of thing that's really helpful to but i think there's a difference between you could do it and <laughs> let me would it be helpful if i told you what other people have done some people have found that it's helpful to split it so i agree with you but why is that different um it sounds less like you're proposing something mm -hmm. yeah. it's less directive yeah yeah so my favorite phrases are, would it be helpful? That's one of my absolute favorite phrases. But then the other is, would it be helpful to talk about what other people have done in your situation? Yeah, I like that one. You know, one, one of the concerns about, about options, if they're not, when you talk about percentages, percentages of 80, 20, or anything less than 50, 50, would almost suggest that one has the advantage or there's one, one Well, let me give you an example. So one of the things that, um, because I charge for my mediations, um, people will often come in where one person earns a whole lot more than the other, and they're talking about how to pay my fee. And so what I'll say is, you know, there are lots of different ways to do it. Um, would it be helpful, then my famous line, would it be helpful for me to talk about what other people have done in your situation? So some people will do 50-50, and I'll start out with that. Some people will do a ratio based on your incomes. Some people will say that the, if somebody has money, they'll front the money, but then out of the settlement, they'll get it back towards 50-50. Other people have, and I just sort of keep listing as long as I can do it. So I think it's, it depends, if you, you never want to say one thing. You always want to say several, and again, to put it off on those other, those other people. So is that enough on this? Should I go on to attorneys? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> so the topic that I was given was how to help attorneys be a positive influence in mediation rather than being controlling. Um, <coughs> and <coughs> I actually work on this a lot. Um, because in my, when I do divorce mediations, I need the attorneys. Um, and I need them for a number of reasons. One is that <clears throat> the parties left to themselves are likely to go so far out on a limb <laughs> that they can't get back without somebody saying, have you noticed that you are so far out on a limb you're about to fall off? And that's what the attorneys are very good at, is sort of, talking them back <laughs> so that they can get into the realm of reality. They often, the parties will start out in la la land and they never move unless somebody can say, you know, you're being ridiculous or no judge would ever. Now, can we say that as mediators? No. Can the attorneys say that to them? Yes. You bet. And do they? Oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> so I really need them to get the parties back into the realm of reality. Um, uh, you're, you're going to respond to a question that I have currently, which is the protection of children in these high conflict divorce cases. When one of the parties, you know, has guns in the house and the other one doesn't. One of the parties has guns in the house. Mm -hmm. And one party raises the question of should there be guns in the house? And 
what, should we go back to item number one of the mediator giving an answer? Well, I mean, some of us, if, you know, <clears throat> I'm mandated if there's a child at risk to report that to protective services. Well, so just because there's a gun in the house doesn't mean there's a child at risk. If a risk. mother comes in and says he doesn't lock up his gun and they're in the middle of a high conflict divorce, which is a situation that I've had, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not currently in that situation. But, you know, people will say things about each other when they're really furious with each other that may or may not be true. Yeah. But if you have a child involved, mm -hmm. then you have a, I mean, you have the responsibility to so, somewhat different. Like Is this related to the attorney issue or not? Um, well, I think sometimes an attorney can help them out. Absolutely. And if the attorney, if they have the attorney who's not the wrong <coughs> who's never handled it before, they have very good insights. Yeah. But if they don't have an attorney, what do you do? So I'm going to, I mean, I'd love to have that conversation with you. I'm just not sure that. Okay, fine. <laughs> we can have that conversation. Okay. <laughs> Is that all right? Or does everybody yes. want to hear the answer to this? No. Okay. Um, so what I try to do is, I think I mentioned to you that I talk to the parties ahead of time. I also try to talk to the attorneys ahead of time. Um, and I talk to the attorneys in a conference call first. And then I talk to them separately. And the, the reason for talking to them in a conference call, <clears throat> yeah, I have all of this in here as my sequence. Um, I never do this in the right order, but this is on page four. It's <laughs> <coughs> very helpful, thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> Can I ask you, Dina, just so I understand, when you say you talk to them separately, do you take both attorneys together and into a room and talk to them? Is that what you mean, or do you mean? So, as a private mediator, I actually call them days before. Okay. Um, as a private mediator, I will call them very early on because what I want to do is to make sure that when they get into the mediation, everybody's prepared, that they have what they need to come into the mediation to actually settle, or if they don't, that everybody understands that's what we're going to be doing at the first session is get all the information that we need in order for them to be able to settle, just so everybody's on the same wavelength about it. So one of the things that I'll ask the attorneys in the conference call is, <clears throat> what do you think your role should be? Are, you, are the parties able to speak for themselves? Or do you think you're going to need to speak for them? And this does a couple of things. One and is- You have both of them on the line. Both of them on the line. And one of the things it does is it tells them that my expectation is that the parties are going to speak, right? Um, but the other is, <clears throat> if they think that the parties aren't able to do that, I need to know that. And then that'll help me uh, to figure out how to design the process. And then I'll say to them, what I want to do is to make sure that the process that we use is one that's going to help the parties reach an agreement. So let's talk about what the options are and let's talk about the way that we want to approach it. So I'm bringing them into my team to design a process. Mm -hmm. I want them to have the same amount of investment that I do in the parties settling in the mediation. So that's the first step of having them do that. Then I will talk to them separately because there's a lot they don't want to say with the other attorney listening in. And they'll often in that separate conversation tell me, the problems that their clients are, are giving them <laughs> and why it's going to be hard to do this, that, or the other thing. And then I can talk more about, well, should they be in separate rooms? Should they be in the same room? Um, should the attorney speak first? In the conference call, I'll be talking about, should the attorney speak first? Should the party speak first? Um, <coughs> and again, that's telling them the parties are going to speak. It's really only the question of, is it first or second? And I want to know what's worrying the attorneys. Um, one of the things that I say to groups like this is, attorneys are people too. <laughs> and the same kinds of things that we do for the parties, we need to do for the attorneys, in the sense that we need to understand their needs and interests, and not just the parties' needs and interests. And they're not always the same. 
So if you think about what are the attorney's needs and interests, what are they? Getting paid. Getting paid, absolutely. What else? Don't they have to show that they have some value in the room to, in order to be paid? Bingo, bingo. They have to show their client that there's a reason that they're there. So if we try to shut them up, they're going to give us a lot of resistance, right? Because they're not showing any value to their clients. So how can we help them show their clients that they're valued? I don't know who was but first. Okay. As you're taking them through the process, are you also giving them timelines or a limited amount of time? You might have one of the attorneys that just wants to continue to... No, I just do you, interrupt. Do you just let them, how long does this process take? Does what process take? How many times do you meet with these people? So as you're saying this, it sounds like it takes a lot longer than the other normal mediation. It depends do. upon the mediation. It just depends upon the particular one. So that's why I can't say it's so going to take this So you say, I'm going to let you speak for, for three to five minutes, or you have, you just... No, I don't. I don't, because it really depends upon the case and the needs of the case, how long people are going to speak. But if, if I think they're talking too long, I have no problem interrupting them. Yeah. Uh, you could, when, when their advice is needed, like specifically ask them for it. Like, right. Do you have information that would be helpful in this or whatever? So giving them an opening so they don't feel like they have to just like jump in. Right. But I also tend to direct the attorneys, just as I direct the parties. So if the parties are talking off topic, what do we do? Get them back. Bring them back to the topic. I do that with the attorneys, too. And I'll ask them, can you tell me about the legal issues in this case? Mm -hmm. So I'm very direct about what I want. And then when they start talking, complaining about the other party, could I get a sense of the legal issues in the case? <laughs> So just keep on bringing them back to what I want them talking about. Um, and if, if an attorney is being obstructive, I interrupt even more. Understanding that the harsher an attorney is, usually the thicker their skin. Not always true. Not always true. But often true. And I'm certainly going to try that. If they get really upset, I'll try a different strategy. And we can talk about what the different strategy might be. But I'm going to start out. If somebody's being very aggressive, I'm going to be very aggressive back first. Not unkind, not nasty, but very firm in terms of what topic I want them to talk about and how long I'm going to get them to do it. Um, that attorney who paced, actually, that's a very funny story. Um, when, when she came into my conference room, she sat in my seat. <laughs> So I moved her. Just by saying, where I'd like you to sit is over there. Not nasty, not mean, but very firm. And she said, oh, did I sit in your seat? And I said, that's fine. I want you over there. <laughs> so <coughs> then when, when she got all worked up <coughs> and started pacing, what I was trying to think about is, is that going to help her? And I decided yes that she needed to move, that that really wasn't a problem for me. We were in caucus. Had the other parties been there, I would have asked her to sit down. But they weren't. So having her pace wasn't a problem at all. And she was talking still, so that was fine. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if I had worried about it, I would have stood up too. So just matching that, and then I would have sat down. And she might have actually sat down with me, because I find that that often does happen. Yeah? What about the attorney who has an appointment after the appointment they've made with their client that you're in your immediate? I'm not understanding the question. So there's an attorney who says, who's pacing because they've got a, another appointment later on in the day. Do you to give them a timeline of how long you think they're going to be staying? Yes, that's really important to do. Okay. And also at the beginning to ask, does anybody have any time problems yeah. that we should know about? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and honor them. So, yeah. 
do you find you have to um, address the adversarial mindset that attorneys are trained in and bring to mediation? Is that something you actively address? So yeah, so in that initial conference call, uh -huh. what I do is to talk about the fact that I do um, facilitative mediation. <clears throat> and that in facilitated mediation, what we're trying to do is problem solving. And that what is so helpful to me is that attorneys are fabulous problem solvers. And that I'm, I'm going to be needing their help and I'm going to be calling on their help mm -hmm. to problem solve with me. Um, and the more that we can do that, the more efficient the mediation is going to be. Yeah? Uh, two questions. In this initial conference call, you explain to them that you're going to be speaking with each of them separately afterwards. Um, yeah, so the, the most difficult thing to schedule is that conference call, mm -hmm. harder than the mediation. So I get a call on the phone saying from somebody's secretary usually, we need to schedule a mediation. And what I say is we need to schedule a conference call with the attorneys first. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to want to talk to each of them separately afterwards. The conference call will last 20 minutes, and then I need another 10 minutes with each of them afterwards. So if you could schedule an hour for each of the attorneys, that will be plenty of time. So I have to lay that all out. And then the, they have been told that they need to schedule a mediation. So they're really worried about this now. <laughs> and I say, well, can we schedule the conference call first, and then I'll know when to schedule the mediation. Now, they're going to have problems scheduling. If they're doing the scheduling, that's a really hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. So they're, And I'm happy to have them do it. I don't want to do it myself, so I'm happy to have them do it. But I really have to help them out in terms of, so you need to get two dates. <laughs> one for the conference call, <laughs> and then one for the mediation. Well, my other question was about uh, DV screening. Do you involve attorneys in that part of the process? So I meet with clients separately first. If, if it's a family mediation, then I'm going to be doing domestic violence screening during that. But I, every kind of case that I do, I meet with the parties separately first. And I can't remember, have I done a, a brown bag on that? No. So I should do that. Because there's, there, the research is just piling up and piling up and piling up about how helpful that is to me. And um, the Res, what are the conflict? Okay, um, it's CCR in Chicago. What is what does CCR stand for? Creative Center for Conflict Resolution. Center for Conflict Resolution. Thank you. That's it. Okay, um, which has a very rigid approach to mediation. And all the years that I've been working with them, um, they have said that they are not going to change their process at all. Has just changed their process mm -hmm. to include um, ten or fifteen minutes ahead of each mediation to talk to the parties separately because they actually had some research done at their center, fascinating research, where they took the same mediators with the same kind of cases, talked to the parties separately first in one, didn't do it with the others, and then looked at the statistics mm -hmm. about settlement. It is an amazing thing to look at. Anyway, that's, that's part of what I'll talk about at this next brown bag. But in any case, I do meet with parties separately first, and I do the DV screening in the family cases. The attorneys are always welcome, and I think that's one of the things that is really helpful in trying to get attorneys not to be so hostile, is to invite them at every point to be part of it with specific roles. Now, what I find is that the attorneys want to know what I'm doing in those separate meetings, and so I'll ask them, would you like to come in and, and see what I do in those meetings? I've never had an attorney come back to a second one because it's boring as hell. <laughs> they know most of this anyway because they've gone through their own individual interview and now they trust what I do because they've seen it. So the only other time they would come in is if the client really needs for them to be there or if I need for them to be there. Yeah. I'm a little uh, puzzled to know whether you are describing something that we will be doing or you are describing something that we would do if we were independent mediators. Not so you would do that if you were independent mediators, right, because the center does mediators. that here. But what I'm trying to do is to just give you a sense of how I try to involve the lawyers at every point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add to that piece of the conversation. It's nothing, so one, the center takes care of the intake that Zena is talking about. We call it intake at our center. 
so there's some time with the lawyers to kind of get some dynamics into what's going on with the case. If you do domestic relations mediations, and every now and then a probate case, there is a DV screen, domestic violence screening step that mediators that do. the mediators do, do that the mediators do before Good. the parties come together, and we have a way of scheduling that so that people are not looking at each other when they're having the screening. But that that's a whole other. So they just come earlier. They just day. come earlier, so we may stagger. But the other thing I'll add to this is that. The state is moving in a direction that domestic violence screening will have to be done for all cases. That's true. That is where That's Doug true. is going. I have no idea when that might happen. So thank you for offering to spend some time on that topic, and we may have to do something about that, maybe in another year or so. But that was um, a part of the summer discussion at, with Lansing that he wants to move in that direction even for your basic general civil, but appears to be a money case, they want that screening to be done. And I don't know what the- I, they, they call it a safety screening. A safety yeah. screening, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it might be on our horizon. So this just wanted to put that out there. This would apply to small claims. That's a civil case. And I don't know yeah. how we would pull that, I don't know how mechanically we'll pull that together. And my guess is it will change everything. Um, we would have to prepare everybody to be able to do that, so some training will be done. Uh, I, you know, but because the topic came up in this setting, I just well, I think it's, I think it's something that might be coming. You might want to call the Center for Conflict Resolution in Chicago. I'm sure Doug is called. I'm sure he's doing yeah, because yeah. they just have made that whole change. And it sounds like it's happening in places in the nation, which is why Doug is saying we need to be yep. thinking about that. Yeah. Okay, so back to attorneys. Um, <coughs> so I just talked about the pre-mediation um, and how, to, how we in, I involve attorneys with that. During the mediation, um, what can we do to help the attorneys feel welcomed and valued during the mediation? question because I don't know I'm sitting here thinking is this a can of worms but it seems like after you get your statements and you're reframing you could say to the attorney is there anything that you'd like to add is that a huge mistake you just hand on the floor and <laughs> just try yes, to balance the yes, room yes that is or? a mistake okay. um, because so, there's always something they want to add yeah. if you're going to ask that do you want to be very directed about what you want from them but so, so when you're saying when the parties do their opening statements and then the mediator reframes, yeah. one of the questions is, do you want the attorneys speaking first or the parties speaking first? Oh, well, I would want the parties first, ideally. Why? Right? So the attorneys don't run over them, but maybe I'm not right. I mean, I don't know. So, so I would say, because I think that's what we've all been taught, right? Right. But I would like to have you rethink it. Hmm. So do you ever have a situation where the parties don't do most of the speaking? In cases where the parties aren't able to speak, if there's not the capacity, absolutely, absolutely. One of the cases that I had years and years ago, um, this was a case of grandparents who had guardianship over a four-year-old um, and the mother, um, their daughter, <laughs> who wanted um, to, to get her daughter back. And the grandparents happened to be very educated professional people. Um, their daughter was um, a high school dropout, um, had been on drugs, had been um, in, in and out of domestic violence shelters. Uh, it was not clear how capable she was of parenting. Um, and they had gotten guardianship because she had said she wanted to go off to California someplace um, and have fun for a little while and, and would her parents take guardianship of of this four, four year old and they had said yes and then um, she decided she wanted the, the daughter back. Well, when I talked with the attorneys, first of all, <clears throat> the mom had no money at all. And so the inter her attorney said, you don't need us in the mediation, do you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, I really do because having talked with the mom, I just wasn't convinced she was able to speak up for herself. And especially against her own parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just thought it was too much of a, <laughs> thanks for nodding. <laughs> 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 um, 
Um, and so I said, no, I, I really need you there. Um, well, what he decided to do, he did, he did come, to his credit, he did come. <clears throat> and th it was interesting because he did do almost all of the talking mm -hmm. in the mediation, whereas with the grandparents, their attorney did almost none because they didn't need for their attorney to do much talking. So there can be that difference. And when he spoke, um, I always wished I had this on tape, he gave one of the most aggressive, nasty um, opening statements about the case that you could ever have, really attacked the grandparents. Um, and basically saying, <clears throat> you raised this daughter, so what makes you think that you can do any better <coughs> than she could do. I mean, it was just a, ooh, ad hominem attack. But that was what the daughter needed. She needed somebody that strong to be able to stand up to her own parents. And so as uncomfortable as it was to listen to, um, it was exactly the right thing for him to do. Did you know that was coming? Nope. If you did know that was coming through past experience with this child, would you have done or said anything? I probably would have asked him not to attack the grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of it, I, th I think it really, and I was watching the, daughter, the, the mom as he was doing this, and she was kind of sitting up straighter <laughs> the longer he talked, and he talked a long time. <laughs> Um, so, no, it's, it's, every case is different. What's needed in every case is different. <clears throat> in that particular case, you wouldn't want the mom speaking first. You would absolutely want the attorney speaking first. Um, in some cases, it's helpful to have the attorneys talk first if you can contain them. Because then it's done. And then, then the parties get to talk. And you sort of have your mediation then. Um, I have a video that I'd love to show, if, if you will allow me, because it took so long for us to set this up. <laughs> this is a video I've shown here before. This is the Moosewood <clears throat> video that was done. Um, this is a, a so this was, um, a business, this was a computer business with a partnership <clears throat> that was failing and the, one of the partners was leaving. And uh, this was uh, a simulation that was done. The, the two partners were um, Washington mediators. Uh, Susan Butterwick was one and Jeffrey Tibbs was the other. And the two attorneys, one of the attorneys was um, formerly a president of the state bar and just beautifully aggressive, I mean, low key and totally aggressive. Um, and so I thought this would be perfect to show for this. So this is the separate meeting with um, Jeff Tibbs as what the person who was leaving the partnership and his attorney. So I'm, I'm just showing you the way the separate meeting goes, but I want to have time to show um, the joint meeting and what that same attorney did in the joint meeting. So. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Tills. So glad Pleased to meet you. you. And I nice to see you again. Yeah. yeah. Um, in this session, what I'd like to do is kind of get a sense of what happened to the business. Sort of how to get started and Thank you. what was the relationship like and then what changed it? What's it like now? And then where you think you're going, <laughs> what it is that you want. And why do you think you're here? Why do you think that your partner ended up filing a lawsuit? Well, I talked to my attorney about all of these issues, and I'd like for him to speak. I think uh, in this particular case, since we are uh, here uh, alone with the mediator and not in joint session, uh, I think you can speak freely because the mediator will hold this in, uh, in confidence. So for this particular session, you can go ahead and speak. Okay, thank you. Um, the reason that this partnership has broken is that while I care very deeply for Susan, and I think that she is very, very bright, and she's done a very, very good job of running the business, 
that I am the creative talent. And as the creative talent, I, I basically own the intellectual property that I think that we created. And Susan, while a very, very wonderful business person, is a very risk averse person. And I'm trying to create the next Microsoft. I believe that we could take going from email in different languages to a worldwide enterprise by just a, another stretch in terms of extension of, of the business. I don't have a non-compete clause. Uh, I brought intellectual property into the relationship. And I think that at some level that I'm willing to share with her the benefits that we, as we move forward. But I need to be able to move forward. And what I said to, to Susan, and I'm very committed to, is that I need us to invest in the business. I can't create without capital. So your feeling is that if she had been less risk averse, you wouldn't be in the place that you're at. That's correct. And that really it's because you have these plans and you you want really to grow the business dynamically. Yes. And you're afraid that she isn't willing to do that. That's correct. And I could also say, and this is maybe a little arrogant, and I'm, but since I can, you allow me to be free, is that I can buy a good account. And you feel that that's really what she is? Well, I think she's a, she's, she's, she's a bean counter. Very smart, but a bean counter nevertheless. Mm -hmm. She can't create the capital that I'm able to create. Mm -hmm. And I'll, tell, I'll say this, and I know you haven't asked me, but she has no right to prevent him from leaving. There is no well, non-compete. If, if no you could hold on a second, what I'd like to do is just sort of get one more question and then I would like to get the legal sense of the case. All right. That'd be terrific. So that's one example. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> um, so Jeffrey, one question that I have is in terms of um, your feelings about how the partnership worked, yes. do you feel that Susan knows that? I, I can't answer that. I don't know. Um, our relationship has broken down quite a lot. Uh, we, we've known each other for years. And we've talked about our most intimate, I'm not going to say secrets, but I will say, we have had very intimate con conversations. Um, not romantic, but just, you know, she knows the beast, and I think I know, I know her. Mm -hmm. And I found that of late, we can't have those conversations anymore. So she may not know what you're really thinking. She probably doesn't know what I'm really thinking. And I'm wondering whether you would be willing to talk about that here. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> I think that depending on how it goes, uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I think that might be something that's worthwhile talking about. Okay, because I think what I have found is that settlement becomes much more possible if there's understanding. And if she doesn't understand, then she may not see the need to go where you think you want to go. Well, I would love for her to, to be well informed. I would love for her to be happy about the decision that's being made. Mm -hmm. Because I think that the, the ultimate outcome is going to be positive for both of us. That's great. Well, it sounds very helpful if you're thinking that it will be a positive outcome for both of you. How do you see that happening? <laughs> Oops. I think that there's there's some money that underlies this. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's money. Mm -hmm. And while I haven't discussed this uh, yet with my the council, I am willing to share some of the results if she is willing to share some of the risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, 
it's very helpful for me to get a sense of this at the beginning. And I'm wondering whether I could also get a sense of the legal case. Yes, as I started to say, uh, I don't think they have a legal case. Mm -hmm. I think it's a frivolous lawsuit. And although Jeffrey here said he's willing to share, I think you have to put that in the perspective that there's not much here for them to, to stop him from doing what he's doing. Uh, as I mentioned before, they have no non-compete agreement, they have no confidentiality agreement, and uh, he has done absolutely nothing wrong. And I think that uh, that should be uh, something that uh, they consider uh, in any kind of resolution that we have here. Do they have any agreement? They have an agreement to share in the proceeds of Moosewood, but Jeffrey has shared in the proceeds. He's, he's complied fully with that agreement. Okay. Anything else that you think would be helpful for me to know going in? I just like for this to be a good, mutually beneficial resolution. That's terrific. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see if we can't get there. Thank you very much. Thank you. So for those of you who know Jeff Tibbs, he is just the sweetest, mm -hmm. kindest <laughs> person. And for him to play this arrogant, I almost burst out laughing in the middle of that <laughs> role play. It was very funny. <clears throat> so, okay, on to the joint session. And in, the, in this session, I asked the parties to talk first. In the joint session, um, I'm asking the attorneys to talk first. And um, do you have a sense of why I would do that, or what would you do that differently? I do it differently, but you're the master, so why do you do this? <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm trying to ask you, yeah. Are you trying to constrain <coughs> the conversation, or focus the conversation a little bit within the, the legal parameters yeah. rather than have it? No, no, I'm trying to do the opposite. To have the attorney speak first. Yeah. Would open up the conversation beyond the, the legal? Yeah, it's really to contain it. So it's to have them talk, to have their peace, and then it be done. Oh, okay. finish them. Finish them. And then go on to have the party talk. Right. But you don't tell And them. because this attorney is so aggressive, <coughs> the attorneys weren't as aggressive, I might do it the other way, but because this attorney is so aggressive, I'm thinking he, he really needs to talk. And he's not going to sit very long without talking. So let's just get it done with and see what happens. <clears throat> um, I think I asked the other attorney to speak first because um, the other attorney was the plaintiff. And I'm going to fast forward. That was I appreciated the opportunity to talk with all of you ahead of time. We had our conference call and then we had our separate meetings. Um, I do want to just remind you of what I had said earlier in terms of the ground rules of, of the process. Um, that the two of you will be giving short opening statements first and then the two of you. Um, that my role is as a neutral, that I don't make any decisions. I'm simply trying to help you reach a settlement. Um, and I am delighted to have heard that both of you really want that as well. Um, anything that was said in the separate sessions is confidential. And this joint session is confidential from the court. Um, so you can feel free to say what you need to say. It won't go out of here. Um, as they always say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Um, so I'm wondering whether the two of you um, can begin, and Jeff as plaintiff. Sure, we be happy to. Well, on behalf of Susan, my client, and myself, I'd like to just say that uh, we're thankful to have everyone at the table talking, too. We certainly think that there's something that we can work out and we'd like to work toward that. It's really been Susan's business savvy that's helped grow Moosewood to where it is today. The idea that uh, she's not the idea person, that it's not her work, instead it's defendant's work that has taken the company where it is, is really absurd. She is the, the brains behind the operation and without her business savvy, the company would just not be where it is today, and I think that... For time's sake, I'm not going to go through his whole... Mm -hmm. I'm going to get to the other attorney. Susan's acting well. Oh, she's a fabulous actress. Mm -hmm. 
She is wonderful. When in, in her separate session, um, I was doing this um, as a comparison uh, mediation. So I did the same mediation as another mediator, and she was, you know, they were both the same people, and she cried at the same spot. Both, and convincingly. Both. <laughs> She's just really good. Yeah. Can I ask you to just comment on the seating arrangement? Oh, yeah. So that is yeah. A, yeah. I don't okay. have parties facing each other. Mm -hmm. Why? Because people are more adversary when they yeah. face each other. Oh, okay. So if it's just the parties and me, it's a triangle. If the parties have attorneys, now, I would have had him, you know, a little bit more. Uh, facing in, but because of the taping, we needed to um, to see his face. But I have them arrayed. I'm on one side, and I have everybody arrayed on the other side. Of course, my favorite is a round table. If I can get a round table, that's, that's the best. I just noticed the aggressive attorneys at the head of the table. It's curious. No, I'm, well, it's yeah, I'm really the focus, but, but yes. Yeah. But I see it's because of the yeah, okay. yeah, it's because of the taping. Thank you. Listen to Jeff, I, I can't believe what I'm hearing. Take those ideas and reuse them for his own gain. Great, well thank you very much. So could we have the legal stance? Yes, I, 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 as I listen to Jeff, I, I can't believe what I'm hearing. There is absolutely no case here, none whatsoever. You, you filed a frivolous lawsuit. Uh, we're going to have this dismissed, and we're going to get our attorney fees for a frivolous lawsuit. You say you're happy to be here. We shouldn't be here. You shouldn't have filed the lawsuit. When you talk so about... I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit from your point of view about the legal stance of the case. The legal stance of the case, there is no non-compete agreement. There's nothing preventing uh, Jeffrey from leaving the company, going elsewhere. There's no confidentiality agreement. I don't believe there are any trade secrets. So what I love about Ed is I interrupted him. I redirected him. He does not miss a beat. He just goes in the other direction and goes on and he talks about the legal stance of the case. So that's really what I wanted to, to just sort of show you is, is when when there is an aggressive attorney, gotta just be <laughs> as aggressive. Yeah. Would you be that aggressive <clears throat> client that went on that kind of track of this is a ridiculous lawsuit? I would redirect them again, you know, to say what I'd like you to speak to is. So it wouldn't be good venting for them to kind of... Well, that's one of the reasons for the separate sessions, is they get to vent there, okay. and then they don't do it as much in the joint session. Mm -hmm. And they also get to vent without the other party rolling their eyes and, mm -hmm. and doing all those things, so they actually get to say what they need mm -hmm. to say. So there's so many reasons why that's helpful. <laughs> if you could put it into one statement of, of why that's helpful, what would you say? Why? Why this, the, the pre-meeting? Uh, it's helpful. I mean, there, there are like 12 different reasons. So it allows the mediator to get rapport with each of the parties. And then when you get into the joint session, you can jump in much faster to intervene because they trust you already. Um, it allows you to really understand their point of view. Um, what I find is if I come in with a joint session, People are speaking about things I don't really have any background on. But if I have the background and I get where they're coming from, I can really speak to their issues a whole lot better. Um, a third is they get to vent there so they don't have to do it as much in the joint session. Um, a fourth is that I have a sense of what the issues are already coming in, uh, not the issues as stated on the court, uh, but, but the issues to the parties. Um, I mean, I could just go on and on and on. So many things. That, and, the, and the research is really showing all of that, which is fun for me to have research back up my opinion. <laughs> so anything else on attorneys before we end the session? This is so much fun. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, Thank you. Well, I, I, I would just like to say that as an attorney, you can go face to face with attorneys, but I'm not an attorney. I'm much more intimidated. By well, so part. we're gonna, one of the things that we're going to have um, the, the state bar um, dispute resolution section is inviting a very famous attorney to come in on March 20th of next year, who is a very famous commercial mediator. He goes head to head with attorneys all the time. He is not an attorney, so it's all the mindset. 
<laughs> Zena, if, yeah. I want to point out that yeah. the good train from Belinda and Sally, we who practice in the, in the small claims division have no issues about how we split the fee. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Al. Very good. So, thank you. Thank you.